Well, today we're going to look at the end of the Nixon administration and the beginning of the Ford administration. Richard Nixon has developed a foreign policy which most presidents have decided to follow. From Presidents Gerald Ford to Barack Obama, they have looked at the same ideas that Nixon first implemented in his first term. Nixon's idea was that the United States, the Soviet Union, and Communist China were superpowers. Now, in an attempt to formulate a policy, Nixon is going to travel to the Soviet Union in 1971. And he is going to say to the Soviets that I don't trust you and you don't trust me. But together we must work together. Or what we today call detente. If you don't trust somebody and they don't trust you, but you know that you must work with them to survive, this is called detente. Now, here you can see Mikhail Gorbachev, excuse me, here you can see Leonid Brezhnev, he's the gentleman on the extreme right. Obviously, you can see Mr. Nixon on the extreme left. Brezhnev had taken over for Khrushchev after the fiasco with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Brezhnev and Nixon are going to formulate a treaty called the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, or SALT for short. Basically what SALT is about is we have more nuclear bombs to destroy the entire world about 30 times over. The Soviet Union had enough atomic bombs to destroy the world 30 times over. Do we need to destroy the world 30 times over? Couldn't we just make it 10 or 15? Well, then maybe we should get rid of some of our nuclear bombs. Now, obviously, we don't trust the Soviets, so we have to watch them dismantle their bombs. They have to watch us dismantle our bombs. Same thing with missiles. We have so many missiles. They have so many missiles. Couldn't we just blow apart some missiles as long as we verify? Now, by the way, in 2020, we are up to about SALT-3. At the same time, Richard Nixon is going to travel to China. Here you can see Mr. Nixon shaking hands with Mao Zedong. Now, Mao Zedong represented the People's Republic of China, or Communist China. We have always believed that the one true China was nationalist policy. We started this idea way back in the 1940s with Harry Truman. Nixon is going to propose that Communist China become part of the United Nations. Now, the only man who could make a, make a statement like this would be an anti-communist like Nixon. And so a lot of times when a politician does something that is very different from what he would have done in the past, we use the expression, well, Nixon went to China. This became the norm out of the ordinary. Now remember, the Vietnam War is still going on. Nixon knows to get reelected in 72, he's going to have to ratchet the war down. Well, where do the North Vietnamese get their supplies? Well, they get them from Soviet Union and China. Maybe if we played nice with the Soviet Union and China, we could persuade them not to give as many supplies to the North Vietnamese, and this would ratchet the war down. In 1968, while Humphrey, Nixon, Wallace, and McGovern were all campaigning for the presidency, the Middle East was threatened by the Six-Day War. Now, the Six-Day War is Israel versus Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. In the Six-Day War, the various Arab countries are going to back Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. The United States is going to be compelled to help out Israel. And this is going to create a hate-hate relationship between the Middle East 
and the United States. If you want to understand why so many countries in the Middle East don't care for the United States, really all you have to do is go back to the Six-Day War. On June 5th, 1967, the largest armed conflict in a decades-long clash over Holy Land in the Middle East erupted. While it lasted just under a week, the Six-Day War would change the geography of the Middle East for decades to come. First, it's important to understand the basics about the disputed territory in and around modern-day Israel. Many Israeli Jews believe that they were entitled to lay claim to the land based on a promise from God, while most Palestinian Arabs, whose ancestors lived there for hundreds of years, believe they were the rightful inhabitants. In May 1948, Israel, with authority from the United Nations, formally declared its independence. In doing so, the Israeli government laid claim to land that had previously been classified as Palestinian territory, including part of the holy city of Jerusalem. The new country was therefore by design surrounded by pro-Palestine Arab nations that opposed Israel's existence. Almost immediately, troops from those neighboring countries invaded Israel and tried to reclaim some of the land. The Israeli government responded by expanding and fortifying its military presence, while peacekeepers from the UN worked to prevent the region from descending into chaos. Over the next two decades, tensions continued to simmer in the region as Israeli and Palestinian forces clashed sometimes violently over trade routes, global political alliances, and their continued dispute over Jerusalem. In the spring of 1967, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser mobilized troops in the Sinai Peninsula, requested the removal of United Nations peacekeeping personnel, and blocked Israeli ships from passing through the Straits of Tehran, moves designed to further disrupt Israel's safety and economic stability in hopes of eliminating the country and reclaiming its land. By mid-May, Egypt and Syria had formalized an alliance along with Jordan and Iraq soon after. The countries began to increase their military presence along their shared borders with Israel. Viewing these actions as antagonistic, the Israeli government decided to move swiftly and act offensively. The timeline went like this. On June 5th, the Israeli military launched simultaneous preemptive attacks the first strike strategy was a resounding success as Israel's air assaults decimated the Egyptian and Syrian air forces before their planes had even left the tarmac. Jordan's government then entered the fight by starting combat operations in West Jerusalem, where they faced and were quickly overmatched by Israeli defensive counterattacks. With the Arab Alliance's air forces incapacitated, Israel was left with advantages on the ground, allowing their troops to expand in multiple directions across the region overpowering their Arab foes and expanding Israeli territory. By June 7th, the United Nations Security Council called for a ceasefire. The Jordanian leadership accepted immediately, and a significantly weakened Egyptian government did the same on June 8th. The Syrian military retreated from the disputed territory of Golan Heights on June 10th, and the ceasefire took effect for all parties involved the following day, thereby ending the war. More than 10,000 members of the pro-Palestine Arab Alliance were killed. Hundreds of thousands of refugees from the captured territories were immediately placed under Israeli rule. Nearly 800 Israeli troops were also killed. Prior to the Six-Day War, Israel spanned 7,200 square miles, roughly the size of New Jersey, and its population was less than 2% of the entire Middle East. As a result of their overwhelming victory, Israel more than doubled its territory by claiming the Gaza Strip and Sinai Peninsula from Egypt, the Golan Heights from Syria, and the West Bank from Jordan, including East Jerusalem. The war may have only lasted six days, but its impact redrew the map of the Middle East. Now, it is important to remember that in your packet for this particular unit, there is a map of the Middle East. The Israelis battled the Egyptians, Jordanians, and Syrians one more time. In 1973, it is the time that the, Jordan, the Jordanians, the Syrians, and the Egyptians will launch an attack on Israel. 
Now, in the Jewish calendar, one of the most holy days of holy days is Yom Kippur. This is when Jews are supposed to go to synagogue, synagogue and absolve their, 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 their people from, from sins that may have been committed. It is on this day that the Egyptians, the Jordanians, and the Syrians will attack. We sometimes refer to this as the Yom Kippur War. Bottom line, Israel was able to be victorious and lost no land. The United States is going to work first in the Six-Day War and later in the Yom Kippur War to provide intelligence. We are going to let the Israelis know exactly where the Arab countries' forces are. The Arab countries decided to retaliate by creating an embargo. Now an embargo is where you withhold something. And the Arab countries decided to embargo oil. Now at that time, almost two-thirds of the oil used in the United States came from someplace other than the United States. Gas became critical. It became almost impossible to find gas, and when you found gas, the price of the gas had risen dramatically. To solve the problem, Mr. Nixon is going to implement an executive action that the fastest you could drive on any federal highway was 55. States were asked to follow suit, and the state of Missouri followed suit. This is also the time of the creation of OPEC. OPEC stands for Oil Producing Exporting Countries, and OPEC used oil over the head of the United States to try to curry favor. We learned yesterday that things went pretty bad for Mr. Nixon. Things also went bad for his vice president. Nixon had asked former Maryland Governor Spiro Agnew to be his running mate in 68. In 72, the Nixon-Agnew ticket was created again. But in 1973, a federal court was looking into influence peddling at the Pimlico racetrack. Pimlico is a big racetrack just right outside of uh, Baltimore. It's, it's where they have the horsey races. One of the uh, rounds of the Triple Crown is there. Well, at the time when these shenanigans were going on, Agnew was governor of the state of Maryland. He was indicted for influence peddling. Agnew said that he would give up the vice presidency if the courts did not charge him with the crime. The courts agreed, and Agnew gave up his Agnew gave up his office. This is also part of the 25th Amendment. Well, I guess we're having some problems with this one here. President Nixon will appoint Gerald Ford, who is minority leader of the U.S. House, to take Spiro Agnew's place. Congress must agree. Again, this is part of the 25th Amendment. Congress quickly agreed, and so now we have Nixon, who is in political trouble because of Watergate, and Gerald Ford, who has just been appointed Vice President of the United States. We know that in August of 1974, feeling pressure from the House and the Senate, being indicted for a crime and most likely going to jail, Richard Nixon invoked another part of the 25th Amendment and resigned the office of President of the United States. Gerald Ford, who had been elected by the good people of Ann Arbor, Michigan, is now President of the United States. President Ford is going to call upon Congress to appoint this man, New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller. Now he is the grandson of John D. Rockefeller of Standard Oil. 
Nelson Rockefeller to be vice president. Now again, this is all part of the 25th Amendment. Now there are some people who say this is a flaw in the 25th Amendment and they point to this particular scenario where you have a president who has been elected only by the people of Ann Arbor, Michigan and a vice president who has only been elected by the people of New York. In October of 1974, about two months after becoming president of the United States, on a Sunday morning, Gerald Ford is going to address the nation and he is going to absolve Richard Nixon for all crimes that Richard Nixon may have performed. It was a month after Nixon uh, resigned, Gerald Ford's president. He went on television uh, early on a Sunday morning to announce that he was giving Nixon a full pardon for Watergate. Now, of course, he went on early Sunday morning hoping no one would notice. <laughs> but it was widely noticed, but not by me. And I was asleep in a hotel room in New York, and Carl called me up and said, have you heard? And I, I said, I haven't heard a thing. And Carl, who really knows how to say what has occurred in the fewest words with the most drama, said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I even was able to figure out. That. And uh, if you remember that time in 74, there was immense suspicions that it was a deal between Ford and Nixon. There was a uh, an aroma of a deal. I think there was the larger question of justice. Why does Nixon get off? Forty people go to jail. And uh, uh, quite frankly, I thought and pretty much uh, concluded there's something smelly about this and what happened. And uh, I think you can look at history and in, in fact in 76 when Ford ran against Carter perhaps he lost because of that part. It certainly didn't help him with the suspicions. Then 25 years later, I undertook uh, one of my book projects, which uh, became a book called Shadow, The Legacy of Watergate in Five Presidencies, Ford through Clinton. And I called Ford up, and I'd never met Ford, never interviewed him, and said I'd like to talk to him about the pardon figure, and he'd want to you know, hang up the phone and say I have a golf tournament. He said, sure. I remember sitting out at Rancho Mirage in his office, and I said, you know, I just, why? And he said, and this is the 30th time I'd asked the question. Now, what Ford said, I'm sorry, the last part of this interview got cut off, but Ford said he had done it for the good of the nation. Now, as Mr. Woodward stated in this interview, there were many people who held this pardon against Gerald Ford when he ran for president in 76. Ford, in his two years as president, is going to face a multitude of problems, one of them being inflation. Now, if you remember a couple of days ago, we talked about stagflation. Stagflation is where there's high unemployment, but also high inflation. What Ford suggested was that we could whip inflation now or win by not buying products. And so Ford is going to go on television and he's going to say, you know, if we don't buy this and we don't buy that, then we can whip inflation. And to show your spirit for this, you were supposed to wear these stupid things that you stuck on your, uh, your clothing, these wind buttons. It was not very popular and not many people decided to do it. This is also going to be a bit of a black mark against the Ford administration. In 1975, as we are getting close to the next presidential election, the last American troops are going to leave Vietnam. It was 
It was chaotic to say the least. American troops were leaving. South Vietnamese who had supported the United States are trying to look for a way to get out of their country as well. North Vietnam and the Viet Cong are going on a nationwide campaign to take over all the cities and towns. It was so chaotic. Americans were convinced that Vietnam would soon be one communistic country, which today it is. The Vietnam War had been extremely costly. Over 53,000 American lives had lost had been lost in Vietnam. Um, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. has the names of all who have been lost in this conflict. They are arranged from the time where they started in 58 to where they ended in 75. If you ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., you should stop by the Vietnam War Memorial. The average age of those who went to Vietnam was 19. Over 75% of all of the people who went to Vietnam were either part of a minority group or very poor. And there was a great deal of resentment for anybody who had gone to Vietnam and participated in the war. There were a lot of Americans who showed anger Anger unjustly, I might add. Over 3 million Americans served in Vietnam. When they came back, they found that the country was opposed to the war and blamed the soldiers for the actions of the president. No parades were held for the Vietnam veterans. In fact, it is one of the wars in which we say we lost. It is a war in which most vets, as soon as they got home, they took off their uniform, they tried to find them the job, and get an education. Now, I had a cousin, Bob, who was an MP in the Vietnam War uh, in 69. And he said that when your time was up, they took you, in his case, off duty. They boarded him on a plane. The plane was to go from Vietnam to Hawaii. When, he said when they got to Hawaii, they got off of that plane and got onto a commercial plane. And they were told that before they got on the commercial plane, they should take off their uniform and put on civilian clothes. In fact, he said the army even provided him with civilian clothes. And he said the reason why they did that was because they were concerned how people would react in the airports if they saw these men and women in uniform. It was during the 1975 that a group of Cambodian pirates are going to capture this ship here the SS Mayaguez. Now the SS Mayaguez is an American ship. It is a cargo ship. And after being taken over, the ship will be forced to dock in a Cambodian port. There, American Marines will be sent in to rescue the crew. Well, it all went horribly wrong. The ship was eventually taken back by the Marines but there was a tremendous loss of life of the Marines and a tremendous loss of life of the, on the crew of the Mayaguez. In 1976, it is time for a presidential election. Now, the Presidential Republican Convention was held in Kansas City, Missouri, the first time Kansas City has ever hosted a presidential convention. The choice was either Gerald Ford, who is on the right, or Ronald Reagan, former governor of the state of California. It was a very contentious convention. Most Missouri delegates wanted Reagan, but the young governor of the state of Missouri, Bond, wanted Ford, and he prevailed. And many people say that's why Bond lost in 76. 
the Democrats were looking for an outsider. They wanted somebody who had never been tainted by Watergate. And they turned to this man, Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter is, says he's going to shake things up. The blue states are Mr. Carter. The red states are Mr. Ford. This isn't as good a map as the one that I normally show you, but you can see that it is a victory for Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter is going to win both in popular votes and in electoral college votes. Now, did the pardoning of Nixon have anything to do with this? There's been a lot of national studies, and most people believe yes. However, time will only tell. Uh, Jimmy Carter is still very much alive, and, and Jimmy Carter has written several books. And Jimmy Carter himself believes that he won in 76 because of Ford and his actions. Well, we are done with today's work. I would ask that you get all your work turned in by 11.59 tonight.